Yep. Okay, Jay, so I'm going to do my normal introduction and we are going to dive straight in this. Anyone who's watching the, um, with the preamble here on the uh, video, this is going to be an awesome interview. So sit back. If you're watching the video, sit back and just enjoy it. So here we go. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast, podcast designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today is Jay Lewis. He is on the Sunshine Coast, and he owns a practice called Elite Foot Care. Now, I'm not going to dive too much into Jay's bio, because this is all going to come about when Jay explains his story, which is why I wanted to have him on this particular, or why I wanted to get him on the podcast is because his story into podiatry is really, really interesting. So sit back and enjoy it. So Jay, how are you doing this morning? Yeah, good. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks for getting me on board for a chat about the journey it's been so far. Uh, it's yes. quite interesting. Yeah. So, okay, I, I want to dive straight into this. It was, yeah, we've got to know each other over the last couple of months just by working together. And it wasn't until just recently you just dropped this one line thing about AFL. And I went, what? What the? But yes. you haven't told me anything. I knew you played AFL in the local competition, but I didn't realise you were a potential legend. Potential. <laughs> I'll hang on that note all the way through. Um, yeah, so AFL, if people don't know, Australian rules football is probably the biggest football, or it is the biggest football league in Australia. Is it? And yeah, it is. Oh, it? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't know that. It is. <laughs> I'm a Queensland. Like yeah, yeah. So with, out of our, all our states, there's two that aren't massively into the sport. And that's one I grew up in, and that's the one you live in, Queensland, and I grew up in New South Wales. So you're a bit of a minority in those two um, in those two states, but the rest of the country live and breathe. The culture is just incredible. You know, it gets handed down who you barrack for, who you go for, through generations, forever and a day. And, you know, you're born with a, a particular jersey or a football in your hand, whether you're a boy or a girl. The families break uh, up over people... Oh, they do. They move. on teams, don't they? It's full on. Yeah, it really it, is. It is so. like a religion. I must admit, like being in Queensland, yeah, we grew up, um, you've heard of Jason Dunstall? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I played one season at AFL and Jason Dunstall was in my team. Excellent. Yeah, so he's a, played over 300 games. Yeah, and uh, he was really good. So I think in the game, we put him at fullback because he could run the whole length of the field and score a goal, where the rest of us were hopeless. <laughs> Queenslanders. But it was, yeah. But it was one of those things that it is like a religion down south, Melbourne, yeah, you know, like Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia. It is just a crazy Incredible. religion. It is. It's 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 a wonderland for anyone who doesn't live there and goes. And you got everyone talking from grandma, the stats on the weekend to you know the little niece and everything. So it's really, really, uh, it's great. It's great for culture. I, I saw a, I saw a video leading up to a grand final once. Must have been the cats one or were heading into the grand final. And there's this little old lady looking about 150 walking across the road, pushing this little bag. All of a sudden, this camera sort of zoomed around on her. She looked up the camera and she goes, Go that cats. Yes. And he just went, My God. <laughs> so, how did, how did you be, in, how did you end up being interested in AFL being from New South Wales, which, um, well, probably, yeah, like AFL has grown a lot in New South Wales and in Queensland. Yeah, hugely. So, I was, yeah, I was, I was a bit of a, a young soccer player like most people, got a bit, too rough for that and I did I saw it on TV and I said let's I said to dad let's give that a go and how old were you then? about 10 years old so I started when I was about 10 and um we you know we joined the local club and uh, I just got introduced to it and anyone can play doesn't matter if you're you know fat tall short doesn't matter there's a role for everyone so it was a, it was really inclusive sport um as a kid as well so we started yeah around 10 and I had no friends that played it so it was um, a very interesting introduction to a sport that I thought was hadn't been around forever, and it's been around over 150 years, but just yeah. not where I was. Um, and then from there, I was, I was in the Central Coast. So I grew up in the Central Coast, about an hour and a half north of Sydney. Okay. And uh, grew up most of my life there playing footy and uh, doing uh, school and stuff. So, we, yeah, we we got right into it, and, and uh, I just was, you know, I guess I was a bit lean and lanky like any kid coming through at about 12 to 15, and I really took a liking. We went undefeated in the under-12s grand final, and um, I said, this, I'm, I really love this. This is, this is great. And I said to Dad, I said, like, I want to have a cracky, I think. He goes, I think let's, let's, uh, look, let's have a look. So we were living on this property on this farm, and we got a, 
we got a, a, a bulldozer in and we, we dad built me a, a small footy oval that we could kick with my brother on the actual farm itself. Oh, that's commitment. Right next to the, uh, to the thing. We had a big slope. So you just cut in this big, um, big platform for us. And, and uh, yeah, we, we, man, we learned to manicure the lawn and, and really get into our own little oval there. So every day you had a foot in your hand at, you know, after school, at, you know, in school. And I was How a, old were you when you made that decision? I was, I was, I was 13 years old when I did that. So in, in under 13s at the time when you were playing, were you like one of the best players in the team? Were, were you were you a standout pretty early on that you actually had? Because in every sport, like I grew up playing rugby league and then switched to union one season at AFL. But yeah, there were certain players that doesn't matter what sport you play, there's always those guys that just, they're a little bit faster than everybody else. They kick longer. They can jump yeah. higher. Was that you at the time? I, 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 I was, I was, I guess. There was a few of us that were really, really good. And I think I made a decision. I was kicking 40 metres, 50 metres at 13. I said, look, we could have a go here. And if I, I really get into it and keep improving year on year, we could we could see what, how far we could go. So we did. We made a commitment, me and my dad at the time. And he goes, well, if you really want to commit, let's, let's do it together. And What did your mum say? Um, well, she was still learning the rules, so, um, and she she still battles. But um, so we, yeah, we went on the journey, and from thirteen, we just we put you know got in your rep teams, and I was a rare breed at school. Like no one played it, and you know it, I was bullied growing up in the in the sport until like people understand and came to an age where you know they respected a bit what was going on, and um, so we were playing a bit of rep footy and things, and it it was really. Is a draft like the NBA every year and things like that. Well, just to go back a step where you said yeah. like in your area where nobody else was actually playing it. So was there a local company? Did you have to drive a distance to actually play this? How, how did you end up playing in a sport where nobody else was doing it? There was like a small a small competition locally. It was you know, five or six teams. And yeah. they, were, they were right into it, those particular people, because they were all people from interstate, Melbourne. Oh, they'd moved to the area. That, that, you know, I'd been there and, you know getting all these new New South Welshmans into the sport. So it was it was it was solid comp. But then when we started going, oh let's have a look, we had we were traveling, we were traveling you know, two to three hours um, down to Sydney, um, west and stuff to play football. And it was it turned into a like the, what's the weekend where are we go and get the Atlas yeah. out and um, and plan the trip. And it was yeah it was around that age where like well around that 15 age where um, you start thinking, oh, what's the opportunities? Where should I be playing footy to try and, um, you know, get looked at in a draft? And, you know, there's a draft that comes around every year and minimal New South Wales, Welshmen, New South Wales people, they don't they don't get picked up. It's very rare just because we don't have the talent. Same with Queensland. There might be one or two, if lucky, or there might not be any. Yeah. Um, so around when I was about 15, they, they introduced this program um, called uh, an AFL scholarship program. And they were given a scholarship. Each team had one to give out to um, someone in New South Wales to try and, like, get them ready to get drafted and get on a list when they turned draft age at 18. And um, and I was working through, like, a lot of a lot of rep footy and we were flying to Melbourne at 15 and, and playing these teams. And, look, we're getting, we're getting belted. We weren't... We weren't we weren't up to the scratch of the natural kids who had a footy in their hand at five years old. You could just tell the difference. Oh, in the blood, yeah, yeah, and um, and yeah, I was um, I was lucky enough to to get the only to get the only Sydney Swans um, at the time, the professional only professional team in New South Wales, to get their scholarship and to join their uh, pre pre rookie list at you know fifteen sixteen, um, and the first one really in the history of, of the program to get picked up. So it was a bit of a full on whirlwind at, you know, around that 16 age where I've, I've all of a sudden gone from a local football club, you know, in a paddock, yeah. the grass isn't even cut to, to going in the club, getting, um, getting introduced to the, the elite of, of any sport that we can offer in Australia and just an environment like that where, um, you know, you you, see, you saw exactly what went on day to day in a professional, you know, football player's life. What was and the, the time culture. commitment? Like, they, so they've they've given the scholarship at sixteen. Yeah, but take it you were still living on the central coast, still at school. So, what was your time commitment to actually having to 
train yeah. with them or play with them or get to meet the other players, the coaches, the, the management? It was about three days a week. So I would, I would, we would get in the car and tr- go down, train, and then um, do everything we needed, like with gym work, um, you know, all that kind of thing, all different, you know, running techniques, everything like that, and then into the skills and stuff. So that was three days a week. So I would be in the car with Dad. Um, back what was the biggest eye opener for you? Like going down there as a, as a child, was it like as a 16-year-old? Was it diet? Did that surprise you when you said about running technique? When they teach you how to run, it all of a sudden you go, wow, I didn't realize I was running so badly. And did you notice improvements straight away? Any, any small things like that along the way? I think when you you go from zero to 100 like that, every single thing you see, it doesn't matter whether it's on the wall or it's a person you meet in the admin, it is just the, the environment is so elite. So even, yeah, we had, we had straight away, we had a diet plan given to me. We had, um, you know, how to, how to run correctly, what you should be doing in the gym, how to, how to kick the football in a particular way. Um, and everything's videoed, there's feedback constantly um, given to you. And so it's a bit of a full-on whirlwind early on when you're just going, where am I, what am I doing? And I, I, I uh, the first time I met the boys, there's 50 people on a list and only 22 play on a weekend. Yeah. And so you might have people injured. There's, there's a reserves team that play before the AFL and the stadiums and things like that. And I got down there and I met the coach at the time, Paul Ruse, and there was a bloke, Adam Goods. And people don't know Adam Goods. He's one of the best Indigenous footballers that ever oh, had yeah. played our game. And um, whether you follow AFL or not, you, everyone knows who Adam. Should know Adam Goods. And and when I when I first got there, Adam and and Paul were there to introduce me to the to the club to the team. And it was were you there going like, holy shit, this is Adam Goods? I was I was there. But Dad was there. We're all looking at each other, trying to not cry or laugh. We're not sure what yeah. the emotions were going on. And yeah, they're six foot four or something, six foot five, and just gentle giants and all. And just it was just an out of body experience, to be honest with you. And they said to me, "Look, we're doing a captain's run, which, which means only the twenty two in the stadium before the game. They had a home game at the Sydney Cricket Ground, and he go, he said, put your boots on.' And I was like, oh, "Yeah, okay." So and he goes, "Come train with us." I was the twenty third man, about fifteen and a half, empty SCG, running around with the ultimate superstars at the time was around 2005, 2006, when they had one of their best teams that ever come through. Yeah. And I look back on that experience and I was my, the only person who was in the stadium was my father sitting there just going, what's going on? And I'm running around with these guys. And that was the probably, uh, probably a very w- unique experience, very young. And I think looking back on that 10 years later, more than 10 years now, is that I was um, – I was very privileged to be in a position like that and be around that environment, that elite um, stature so early on. And looking back now, it's in what I do now, it's, it's been a really, uh, it's been complimented what I've, what I've been doing. So I think, um, I think, yeah, these experiences you have, you look back and it's, it's a pretty, pretty full on thing. Um, but after that, we kind of, we kind of, about 16, I started playing the, in the reserves team for, for the Sydney Swans. And okay. I was, I didn't have much meat on me, you know. I um, the only thing that got me through was me going, you know, pretty aggressive at the football and that, and uh, and being very fit. And we would, I would be at school, and by that stage, Dad said it's time to get the train. And uh, so I was on the train hour and a half into the SCG. We had to get on a bus, and they played in the Canberra team. So it was a first three hours south. I'd have my schoolwork. I'd get on the bus, and uh, down to Canberra would go on a Friday night, stay the night. Playing Canberra was about three degrees. And um, and there was not much of me, and and then you'd get back on the uh, on on the bus and come home, and then I'd have to get a, a train out of there late Sunday night, ten pm, back in the Central Coast, back ready for school on Monday. So it was um, a very intense period um, for myself, and in between that, with our state commitments, with our football teams, we were in the state and things like that. Um, in between those games, so. The balance and the commitment and the goal setting that you required to get through a period like that was, um, it was quite, a, a quite in, yeah, quite full on for any, any. I was going to say, because there'd be a lot of planning, wouldn't there? Because at the same time, I'm sure your mum was making sure you got your schoolwork done. Yeah. And even though your dad's going, yeah, football, right, right. He was like yeah. right into it and pushing you. But there would have been a lot of planning to be able to train, play, still get your schoolwork done. 
because I'm sure if all of a sudden you were failing at school, your mum probably would have brought it into it pretty quickly. Yeah, there wasn't. Yeah, so there was a balancing act the whole time. Uh, yeah, so we we had to. Yeah, I had to, We had to have plans in place. The goals were just so important, and the club went through all the goals. And you know, being in that environment, you get you get introduced to leadership quite early, and we're, we're talking leadership of the highest caliber. Um, people that run these organisations that really keep people very accountable. It doesn't matter if you're on the front desk or you're picking up the water bottles, you know, or your skinniest bloke, the youngest bloke there, which is me at the time. Everyone was, had to be very accountable. And the Sydney Swans have a very long history and culture, um, and they're called the Bloods, and it's been around for over a century. Um, and... This culture, I mean, everyone puts in. It's hard work, and it's very known within Australia the culture that they try and they try, they've, they've built there over the years. Um, and and if you're not keeping up with that, that you know what their rules are, and, and you know and what their commitment to you and your commitment to them it means, then um, you, you, you get shown the door quite quickly. So it it was it, you know it was fun and all that, but also it was if you're not pulling the line. And doing what the goals are doing and getting in line with the team and what we're trying to achieve, then you, you'd be on the outer quite quickly. So all these things, um, as a young person getting introduced, uh, it's, it's, it was really intense. So um, going forward, we kept playing football and, and um, around 18, 19. So my contract had kind of finished up four years in. And during that time, they won, they broke their drought premiership of 72 years, the longest for any t- any team's ever not won a premiership, which is the grand final. Well, they weren't just, like the Swans, were they? They were a no, relocated team from Melbourne to yes. Sydney. In 80, 82, they were relocated from from Melbourne to Sydney. And then they had still had one, obviously, and then got to yeah. Sydney. And um, 72 years, 05, won, won the, the premiership, and it was quite a, an achievement for the whole country really in the league of this struggling football team financially just off field everything on field they struggled to to seeing them succeed and it was just happened to be when i was there the best they had the best 22 yeah. in the world at the time um how cool so, was it being part of the club during that that time look it was really incredible you know even after games before games i was there helping out and i'm you know, walking around there and you're just seeing everyone prepare and what you know, every, how everyone prepares differently and, and what other people, you know, what, they're, what they require. You know, people getting needles over here, people getting different treatments here, the strapping, just what the, the, even the, the health team, what they go through to get these boys up week in, week out, to get them on the field. So that year they had, they had one injury uh, for the whole season. So it was, it was um, dubbed one of the best medical teams to get them to that premiership that year, because you see 16 on an injury list up to 20. And this particular year, they had their whole list available, which means everyone's fighting for a position position to get in that that, that starting team, which which becomes an environment within an environment because it becomes so competitive that you're working so hard to knock your mate down to get in front of his spot. And if so all of a sudden you've got you've got mates, but then you're not mates and you want him to fail, but we've got to succeed together. So it was it was a confusing situation it, when I was learning what was going on here. You, you wanted all to have success as a team, but yourself individually, the only way to be successful is to try and knock everyone around your way to get your spot. And once you got your spot, then you could sit down and, you know, and try and keep your spot and be more settled. But, you know, it's in an environment like that, it can be, it, it's, it, it can be very intense in regards to, am I still, am I still okay in my spot? You know, am I getting kicked out here or next week? You're just not sure what's going to happen. So it's a really roller coaster of emotions. One week you're playing the best football you ever played. The next week, you know, you don't, you shouldn't even be there. And it's just this, you know, it's a really emotional. And then you go home, you've got to sit on it for a week. And you're only good as your last game. So so that that kind of um, those emotions early on, late teens, um, of expectations, reality. Um, you know, getting knocked back and getting knocked back quite hard and then having to work really hard to get back to the top. It's, um, it does set you up, I think, long term. How many years were you there for? 
I was there for four and a half years and then got off, came back for a couple of games in my fifth year. Um, and then obviously couldn't get back, couldn't get in that team at the time. So I, I, um, I you know, at, at the end of that, you put all your eggs in that basket. You know, you've worked your, your whole like, like 10 years to get to this position. Were you around 20 yeah. then when, when this happened? I was around 20, and usually around that time, if you haven't got offered another one, you're pretty much done. Um, so it was like a, a four year, like a four-year stint to start with? Yeah, four-year stint. And then if you don't get re-offered a contract, you either try and get redrafted elsewhere, but yeah. it is quite difficult because the draft is always coming through every year. So, you know, I was at a position where, what do I do now? I've, I have no idea what to do. Like, what what is uh, what do you do? So... During that time, I was really loving all the medical side of things, and I really enjoyed, you know, going to speed school, which we call it, to to learn how to run quicker and and different injuries and what treatments meant for different guys, and just how diligent you need to be with rehab to get you back to your best. And this is the first time I really got introduced to to podiatry. Um, you know, there was a box in the club; it was huge, and uh, people who didn't like particular boot they were wearing they'd put it in this box and it was it was huge i would be taking boots out as a young bloke because they were going to get thrown out eventually at the end of the year with different people's numbers and we're talking legends the game yeah you know, number 24 on the back or goods he's number 37 and he's got a pair of turf boots in there so i'll just grab them you know give them one of the boys <laughs> and um you all of a sudden you're trying all these different boots on different um companies shoes so i got introduced to like the foot football boot side of things there. This is not knowing that I knew, I didn't know what podiatry, how to spell it at the time. Yes. And and then, so, uh, we, yeah, so it was all over. It was like a flash in a pan. It was really fun. It was all when, over. When the X came down, was it really fast or did you did you know, like, yeah. heading towards the end of that fourth year, it was pretty much coming to an end? You do. I think you do know because, you go, know, how was my season this year? Did I do enough? What are the... Who are they getting in? Who are they look replacing? Who's been playing better than me in that particular position? And yeah, I think you do know, and it, it's inevitable. I think you know, and it is a a position where it's like it's a bit hush hush, but you know, everyone's got to come and have a meeting, and and they're probably going to show you the door. And I think that's the most. And you got you got to remember, there's 45 blokes, and probably you know, 15 of them are having that same conversation at the time. So it goes from a really happy place to <clears throat> you won't see that person for a long time, and you know, they'll go to the the pub will catch up with their boys and you won't see them and they'll just work out their next move. And, and I think that part of sport is never spoken about when that 15 or 20 blokes who get moved yeah. on and what they're going through. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just, it's a, a place of, of uh, uncertainty for a lot of people. And I was really in that boat. What am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? Everyone knows me as this footballer. That's who I am in a, fr- a friendship group. I'm this guy who should have, Keep kept going on with it, but the reality is, you know, the average player, even when you make the list, you know, they're they're not playing many games. That's four years on a list there. That's the average, and you got the elite people, you know, there for 12, 15 years playing three hundred games, and it's just not a reality for everyone. Yeah, and- I've heard that even in uh, like NRL, Gus Gould. I don't know if you know who he is, Gus Gould, and and he talks about the average football player is lucky if they play fifty games at the top level. So when you see these guys hit 100, 150, 200, 300 games, because that is so rare when you have a look at the amount of players that are actually on a roster at any given time that are going through the system. Yeah, look, it is so it's, it's so true. Um, and there's people, you know, they have their core people and they're they're the elite. They earn their coin. The pressure they're under to perform week in, week out to get their bodies up is, um, is something we don't see. We don't see any of that in it. And they do get paid a lot and they deserve it. And even just mental health strength in there, their, their headspace is so strong compared to other people that um, it's something to really behold. And, 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 and I was so lucky to see that um, during my time and the leadership to get yourself up and to get other people up around you was um, it, you see respect in the group, you see the group playing then you see the previous person training then you see someone in that authority come over and people just respect that person straight away. And they know that this is my place and where where I sit. And that's how the team as one comes together. Um, so it was, it was a an interesting experience that I kept I kept. And I think what I learned from it is although you're an individual, 
you know, you never get success without the team. You can't do it on your own. And now in my career at the moment, my small team that I have, it is, it is we work for each other and no one's better than anyone. And if, if one was going well, um, well, you bring the other person with us. And if we're both and one is not going well, then we're not going well. So it's important that it's a, it's a very team approach. And I think that I've taken that out of my, my small stint in the system is um, the team is, it comes, comes first. If you're going well and the other person isn't, what's the point? So that's been a really well, good... There's a couple of things you mentioned as you were going through that uh, over that four years. And I was writing a couple of things down. One was when you were talking about just the goal setting, like from the start, like as a, when you were 16, balancing school and managing your time and all that. Uh, and even when you're talking about the competitiveness between, yeah, you have friends in the team, but one minute you're actually your friends and you've got to work as a team, but you're also competitors. And I think you probably find that even within the profession, you'll have friends that are podiatrists. You get friends that are in the same area as you, yet yes. you're all trying to lift podiatry at the same time. But at the same time, you're also competitive, but you don't need to be nasty about it. Yes. It's like, to how much should I share or am yeah. I giving away too much and all these kind of things, which, um, which I think in our profession, we're quite a small profession. And I have a small group now that I um, bounce off. And I think we're trying to create a, a bit of a, not a, I guess a culture between uh, other business owners in my group that we're here to help and support each other, especially if something goes wrong, like give us a call or let's work through it together. And it's good because then if you need something like that, then the team will help you around you. And this is a team with it outside your team um, with different, they, they're seeing everything from outside, which is also good, but they're not so internal. And so what was your exposure to podiatry though? Like as a, as yeah. a player, who was, do you know, remember the podiatrist that was involved and what sparked? We had a few times in another profession. Yeah, no, well, we, so we had, we had like our speed school. So every, every, um, every time you trained, you had speed school, went for 30 minutes. It was running technique, pure running technique, how to get the most power out of your body. And I really enjoyed that. I, I didn't realize it was so technical and where you, your knee should be and, all this kind of thing. I just, I just saw the footy and got it. So, um, you know, and and I, I learned early techniques of how to how to switch on different muscles and and how to be the most explosive when you're jumping and all this kind of thing. And through the through that journey, what what happened was I was um, I finished up and and I I resonated quite quite um nicely with with all those the staff that kind of implemented the program and i used to pick their brains a bit and i used to always want to know what, what's the point of you know our leg moving in a certain direction at the time you know in swing phase and all this and we used to sit back and they used to record us so we used to go through so i was doing gait assessments at 16 yeah uh, in the elite environment not knowing that i would end up doing this long term not knowing any other side of it nothing else so um, that was my first real introduction to to it at the time, and and then it came into the second induction. It was it was the injury side of it, so the rehab group. You had all the doctors and the physios coming together, looking at each individual and and planning really individual, customized programs to get this person back to an elite level, um, and that that just resonated with me too. That there was just so much involved and and the professionalism of how to get a person back to their full capacity, um, whether it well now, whether it's, you know, getting in the garden or whether it's, you know, going to the Olympics, there's this whole different um, way to get a treatment plan to that person's goal. So that was really, um, really early introduction to, to the profession there. And it sounds like that's what's the difference between the backyard athlete and the professional athlete. The professional athlete is almost like a fine tuned machine. I've got a friend up here who's my physio in Cairns who I think was at the Melbourne Storm for about 10 years with the Melbourne Storm. And he just said, they're like, he said, when you're working with a team, it's like training racehorses. Oh, he yeah. said, it's just, he said, they're, they're just, they're so elite compared to everybody else, but they, and they're so fine tuned, but they can break really easily. Well, they can, they can, they can. Oh, that's so true. And if you if you miss a kick and someone steps the wrong way and they do an ankle, 
you, you, you don't want to look at anybody because you've almost broke this poor guy's ankle because you put yeah. the kick the wrong side. And every time someone falls down, it's like, oh, everyone just holds themselves. Oh, no, he's out, he's done. You know, and there's, there's a hush amongst everyone. And it can be like that. Although they're the fittest, strongest, most ripped up men you've ever seen, small things can um, undo them. And then, you know, it's four weeks of intense rehab to get them back, especially when you're looking at winning a premiership. Anything that goes wrong there... It's, I remember, uh, I remember hearing a story about on. a particular football player, and this was in league, and he was like a big, burly, tough prop, you know, 120 kilos. Yeah, just a, an animal out in the field. He yeah. rarely ever got injured. And then one day he's changing a light bulb and he steps down off a stool. Yeah. And as he steps down off the stool, did his knee and was out for 12 months. Yeah. And then we go, oh, my God. It's crazy. At the front of the office, there was a small chain. It was a little fence. And one of the boys tried to just step over it and he slipped and he, he fell and he broke his arm walking into the club and he was out for eight weeks and he was one of the best in the back line at the time walking into the club. So you do have those freak accents. So at the time, there was a guy called Ty Canelli. He was an Irish guy. One of the, one of the first Irish guys to come over because a lot of Ireland guys, Irish guys play their um, Ireland football over there. Gaelic. Gaelic, Gaelic yeah. And... Um, <clears throat> If you're following during the time, Ty Canelli, he's, 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 his shoulder used to pop out really yeah. easily. And during games, it would it would pop out and one of the boys would go up to him and try and put his shoulder back in. And um, it was quite full on. So he, and it, like, obviously, it's sublux. It's, it's, it needs surgery, but they couldn't yeah. do it obviously during season. So he ended up having one of the best kicks in, in Australia at the time to kick the footy. And they just kept him in and they... They put his shoulder back in week in, week out. And Afer he was a big part. He was he had needles in his shoulder to get him up. And he was one of the best players in their grand final time with this horrific shoulder injury. Oh, that's right. I can I can edit that out of the out of the actual uh, podcast. <laughs> So anyway, people, if you're watching the video at the moment, there was a slight glitch there. What was? What were they? Were they chopping something down? It's like a um, chainsaw. Yeah, someone's trying to come through this my wall next door. So we've managed to to hold it back, which is uh, that's funny. Yeah. Where were we? Ah, uh, where were we? Yeah, just talking about injuries and how you know how people push through injuries, and you wouldn't even know being on the sideline or yeah. what's going on down under the rooms with needles and and different techniques. So. The body putting themselves uh, under that duress and uh, in that environment. I wonder how they're, they're feeling right now. Some of those. Well, they always say that retired football players, regardless of what code it is, whether it's AFL, rugby union, rugby league, yeah, they always say, "Oh, how are they going to feel when they're in the 40s and 50s?" I think a lot of them will be feeling a little bit of pain. I think so, and I, I, well, I'm almost 30 now, and I'm struggling. And it's uh, so how did you how did you yeah. so mentally? You knew at yeah 20 that your AFL yeah. career was, you, you could have tried to get to another club, but all of a sudden, yeah, you spoke to your mum, your mum talked sense in you and said, why don't you use your brain now yeah, and do something else? So you decided to do podiatry. What what was it that made you go podiatry was going to be the career? Well, it was at my local university and we had a, we had a, we had Newcastle uh, Uni about now and up north and we had a small campus on the central coast that did podiatry. So everyone from Sydney and Newcastle. The Rimba. Um, yeah, Rimba. Rimba campus. Exactly right. I had to come to our our neck of the woods. And um, I still didn't have any idea really what really was involved with, with podiatry. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, I put it as my preference and I, I got in there. And I think I just resonated really, uh, really quickly. I, I um, it was very hands-on and, and all this kind of thing. And after getting through all the, all the, you know, all the content, the study of the whole body of first year, you could really start cracking into, oh, let's get into what, what's this about? And, um, and you know, seeing and being in that sporting environment, I just, I just, I loved it. I was just got involved and, you know, caring for people and, and looking at how we can get them to their peak fitness and in whatever goal they had set at the time. Um, I just, yeah, I just went to it and I said, this is, this is kind of where I want to be. And I had at the time really good mentors and lecturers there that I really resonated with and, and got through in straight sets there and, and went and exposed myself to as much podiatry around the country at the time. Um, 
and uh, you know I was under a, a pod surgeon at one stage in uh, in near Byron Bay and uh, up at the Gold Coast, and it just started becoming like this could be for me. I really enjoyed every every facet of it, whether it was you know doing something uh, with a dirty dirty wound early on to, yeah. to try to rehab somebody back to their to their peak fitness. So you didn't have the mentality that you just wanted to be a sports podiatrist. You were happy with all aspects of podiatry. I was, I was, I was, I was really happy with a lot of uh, all of it. So um, even, you know, all our, our nail surgeries and everything, I just wanted to, I just wanted to see all of it and what was involved in it. Um, and it wasn't until kind of later in my, when I finished up and, and went and got a, a job that we really doubled down on our, on our gait assessment and using technology and pressure platforms and, and different cameras that I, I really kind of, I could see it in my brain, how things worked and, and how yeah. things put together and how you could, you could see different forces. So um, when you, when you first graduated, where did you work initially? So graduation, I, I got offered this job by the tutor and it was about three hours in the blue mountains. And um, I, I was there for about, about three weeks and it was like two, three days a week. And I'd stay in this old little church at the yeah. time. And it was one of the clients that they said, oh, $50 a night, come down and, and you can stay in my church. Freezing cold, like, you know, it's not where I thought I was going to be early on in the in the piece. Yeah. And um, and the, the tutor at the time, she she had a bit of a breakdown and she had to, she had to get out of there and had a family issue and all these kind of things. And um, she said, Jay, I... I I've got to leave you the business and you've got to, you've got to keep it going. And I'm, I'm about four weeks out yeah. you know, into the new job. And, and all of a sudden I've got this business in my, my car and I'm, I'm going down to this, this clinic and, you know, there's a couple of doctors there and they say, we've got all these people with it. And it was about 22, 24 patients a day. And I'm just like, this is, this is, this is full on. So I, I had to get really, good very quickly and yeah. I had to make a lot of mistakes very early on to know um you know how 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 to kind of get through the people and deal with different personalities and and get these people rebooking and things like that so that was my first introduction was 100 percent 10 12 hour days uh, in this small town and I was the podiatrist that came and looked after this whole town so I was, you know this young little guy in this little button up top you know going from an elite stadium environment with these players to this town looking after everyone's, you know, trying to keep these But did you find like, leg. but did you find what you went through? Yeah. You know, like in your young year from 16 to 20 in that elite environment, sort of, I, I think it gave you a particular mindset that you'd be able to cope with anything if it was thrown at you. I think, I think that's kind of how I, I kept up. It's like, I've been through a lot worse than this. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and I think I was a bit more in control of the situation where it's where I was before. You don't have control of everything. You can only do, you can only have control of yourself, but you don't have control of everything. But in this particular new environment, I was like, I can control this. I can steer people where I need them to steer. I can control what they do and, and what the doctor does with this particular person. So the element just, it gave me a whole new element of, of, um, of that control. And I just, yeah, we got through it, and um, it's, I'm so happy I went through that experience at the time. Did she come back? Um, did the she boss? Finally, she did. She finally yeah. came back, and um, and then yeah, she said, "Oh, you're doing really well here," and um, she kind of just let me take over that whole business, and I kind of grew that um, for her over that period of 12 months or so. Yeah. yeah. At the same time, I got offered a gig in Sydney, and we. Um, it was it was a an, an Asian guy who owned a few clinics, and they hadn't had a podiatrist there for quite some time. And he goes, "I've got, you know, a lot of there's all orthotics and and walking gait and all this." And I was like, oh, "I'm in, like this is exciting. We have got backed up patients." So I, I I took I went up there and visited him. He had some cool equipment. And he goes, "You'll be the head guy. You'll be the head guy." And I said, "Like, yeah, excellent." So I um I went up there still like hadn't been under a podiatrist for a while still just trying to learn my feet yeah and they did they had they had uh i was in a, a super clinic of, of these 12 clinics and there was all asian doctors and you'd book one person and six of the family would rock up and you know they all spoke mandarin and my receptions at that time had half broken you know translation in english of of what's going on and i'm sitting there and i'm just going this is this is this is fine <laughs> 
yeah, they want everything for free. They got their private health care there and they're coming in. So I'm doing gait assessments. Are they haggling? Are they haggling with you? They're haggling. I'm trying to learn the language. I'm trying to learn Mandarin at the same time. I'm learning, yeah. you know, how to use this this uh, this technology stuff. We had a first introduction. You know, lunchtime I'm with twelve doctors. We're having the Chinese tea and all the meals, and I'm the only white guy with freckles getting around. You know, in a in a big distance <laughs> there, and um and you know, and they were just saying, Jay, we'll send all these people, and we had a meeting. So that my first kind of twelve months was a very uh, eye-opening experience um, and comparing it to my peers at the time you know they, they would lose it because they just had no idea what was, what was going on but um, I think uh, that experience now years, years gone by has helped me get to how, how long did you do that job for that was another 12 months I think you know yeah I um, yeah and then I end up I end, I end up getting a put on just there for and training those that person up and that's that piece is still running and i touch base with the, those people um here here and there and there's three or four of them now doing doing what we set up so that is that that was an experience too so it's, it's the journey has not been linear it's been um been quite interesting it's had some interesting turns and then i got to a stage where it's like how am i going to keep increasing and what am i going to do here because um, i'm not getting around anybody i'm not getting around yeah. so after work i would go to my local back on the central coast where I was living and I would, I would go to the, the clinics and get in the back grinder room and get myself around these people um, because I knew those skills I was going to lose. And I made sure I was just exposing myself in those early days to absolutely everything I could possibly do. So I was in the, I was in there. I was, I was still even, I guess you call it volunteering. I was the days off. Um, I'd go in and hang out with a, a very senior podiatrist locally. I'd just pop in there and help them out. So I was keeping in touch with all that. Um, and I think that's really important. I think a lot of sometimes, like I've heard, you know, people will graduate and they'll, they'll work somewhere for 12 months. It might be, you know, a good place. It could be a dodgy place where they work, but then they go and set up for themselves. That, yeah, they do. And um, you could see what not to do, I think, in those yeah. places and and how, how much, uh, what what is the best way to do things. And it probably wasn't what you got introduced to. And that's why... Uh, these days it's really good to see that and it's so important even now for me as an early business owner to go and hang out with peers and the group that I have around me because I want to see what's going on over there because you only know what you know and if you're doing a particular thing there's always maybe sometimes you can do it better or you could have some um, someone you know give their opinion on what you're doing and I think you've got to be so open to those kind of mm. things as you're developing these things and that's uh, that's what well, I think it, that goes back to your sport as well from 16 to 20 you were hanging around people who are far better than you oh yeah they well, every well. day you were going to training you were learning something new so you knew the more you hung around them yeah and if they kept you there for another four years even if you never played at the top league you sort of learned something every day just by hanging around them yeah every single day and like, I think that yeah. applies back to your profession it's so it does it does and I go back to the leadership and the and the goal setting and it's just so important to have those goals and what you want to achieve for that particular block within within yourself but within your business and your team and uh, and how can you achieve those goals you can't do it on your own you have to have those people have their um, have their two cents because it's really healthy to see and help you grow your goal at the time yeah um, so I've learned that it's it's so it's such a team approach even if you don't have a team it's still a team approach from people around you you may be a solo person but you just you're not solo in life so um whether that's yeah you know, you know, a good mate that you he's not a podiatrist but you you can dump all all your day on or uh it, you know or it's a physio or it's even someone who's not in your profession who's got another business so um that that team that culture is it's been a real a revelation in my life and it's kept me going and you know when you're flat and you and people are flat constantly that you have that team around you to get you up and about and you, know, you can't do it on your own and you don't win premierships you know solo so it's very no. important and that was why you know when i set up the spartans group was yeah. the whole idea of that was to bring people in that and that's why yeah, it's to be in the group you've got to be accepted by everybody else in the group yeah, it's so true. Because it's, you've got to feel really comfortable with each other and you got you want to be able to talk open with each other and then be able to bounce ideas off of each other as well. Yeah, and uh, obviously getting... I'm in the group and it's been great to be introduced and they're very uh, welcoming. So it feels like home straight away and thank you for a that. A little so bit nutty really... sometimes, but... Oh, we all are. <laughs> Who's the leader? Uh, What's that? 
who's the leader of the group? They're the nuttiest. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know who that would be. Um, so yeah. where? So what took you to the Sunshine Coast? So it was that period of like, if I keep going the way I'm going, yeah, I don't the growth that I've reached my max growth period, and it's like I can't, I can't keep going anywhere here. So I got offered a job on the Sunny Coast, and I've been, I grew up on where I, where I did uni for many years and I was you know, in Sydney. So I was in a little bubble almost and it was time, it was time to grow. So, so you'd I'm stayed in your whole comfort zone, the whole, the whole, like really even oh, with your the sport and you just, you stayed in the comfortable area. Yeah, four hour radius, I reckon pretty yeah. much exactly right. And it was time to go, you know, pack the car, everything I owned. I had a, I, look, I had a, I had a big group of, of, of friends back on the central coast over years. And I played a lot of football, on the central coast as well. And I did, I packed the car and everything I owned and um, I, I drove up. I'd never been to the Sunshine Coast and I'd sent in maybe a couple of pictures. I Googled it and had a look. And I said, oh, there's some beaches. You know, that's going to look all right. I did a little bit of surfing and uh, I had a bit of footy up there and it was mid season and I was playing at a football club that I'd been at and I had a lot of success locally. And um, and just just on that, well, after, the, after I, you know, it was all over the dream, I joined the central a central coast team called Terrigal Evoca, and there was no money involved. There was no pressure. People were there to dump their stuff that they've gone through the week. And that team, I think, uh, helped me grow, not just as uh, a footballer, but also as like a young man coming through that some people had similar experiences and we all ended up in this football club, a local yeah. football club. And we had so much success I'd never had so much fun playing football because the, the pressure wasn't there and the, the peaks and troughs didn't come so often. And uh, we won a few premierships there. And I, you know, I helped captain that club at 21, 22 with one of my best mates who, who's still down there at the moment. And um, and I have I have close mates, great great friendships in the culture we built there. It's I haven't been there now. It's nine years since I got there. They have won 33 games straight. And... Uh, and they're just that culture is just unbelievable. And the Continue young guys on. come through. It is, and the old boys. And I had mentors outside of a professional in in a, an amateur league where they helped me also get to where I am. And, and I, I thank them a lot. And I think that culture again in that club it just it helps you as a young male, as a young man going forward. So mid season that year, I left, and I, it was it was a big decision. I've been there. I played for yeah. one championships. I, I'm doing podiatry. I had a friends everywhere good people around me my parents were there every everything I said it's time and I, I packed the car and I got off of this job and I this I had a mentor that wanted to take me on and and I moved up and um, I checked it out and and I entered a, a practice that was quite quite well established and had some really good um, really good followers behind it and I, I learned a bit more of my trade um, there so that that experience is great moving up and and it, you know, as a footballer, you could join a football club not knowing anyone, and you got thirty mates the next week. Yeah, and, um, and I was lucky enough they hadn't won one for twenty five years, and all of a sudden we're there with are and I'm in a team, and we've won one, and I've got a you know a new set of friends and and all that. And since then, that was a few years ago. I've um, my, my my family have moved up, and oh, they're on the uh, Sunshine Coast too, yeah. and everyone's here now. Four years later, and that's the best move everyone's made, and we're loving it. And um, so, what what was the decision be? between so moving the sunshine coast which is a no-brainer if anyone's ever been the sunshine coast it's a beautiful place uh so you're there you're working for somebody else what was the what was the mental switch that went off in your head that said now i need to yeah i need to work for a lunatic you want to work for yourself this is true yeah and i think it's still a stage where <laughs> you've you've learned a lot of things and you know different uh things to get how to get people up and achieving their, their goals. And you, you've learned all that patient side. And then it was time for me to go, I think I can really excel myself now alone and uh, and do similar things in my own shop. And you just have, you know, do your own, make your own decisions. But I think yeah. the biggest thing is that was around the six, seven year mark. And I think a lot of people, and now I speak to my peers, they, they're, they're done with it. They haven't refocused or relearned new things. I've had a few people doing different different professions now and it kind of it's not like that each but it's like i've got to keep growing here what what is my next move whether that's going deeper into research or or um going up a level in the current 
corporation you play. Mine was it's time to do my own thing and, and grow my small legacy and um, and build an environment that I've got all this all this knowledge from and build something that is going to be um, something that I'm really proud of and things like that. So that's the period I got to, and it, it came to an end. So I started. Yeah, finding a premises and in between that gap, I, I did work for another person. So I was getting always constantly exposed to different businesses, how they're set up. And um, and I did, I got offered, I met these doctors and I said, hey, we've got a room, let's build a room for you. And I um, I said, let's let's have a let's have a crack. So we uh, we did that and I started in this small room with three doctors and uh, we just grew that. A year on from that, my brother had done, he was an engineer and he he was a bit in a rut with his engineering. He also did finance. Yeah. So he'd done a lot. And I said, let's let's find a place. And would you like to have a, a go with me? And we found a derelict building in this small country town. And um, he quit his job and he painted day in, day out. We built the place. I was after work there. And we've just created this beautiful um, country, um, in, like clinic environment that the whole town has resonated with. We're six months now. And it's been... a, a a beautiful introduction to the town businesses around us it's like an old community it's only 15 yeah. minutes away from the beach here and it's um been amazing for us and and we're already looking to expand again and, and get get another podiatrist on to help me out and and that particular part of it is giving me a new fresh uh, life and especially getting yourself on board with a, a couple of your um your pieces on what can improve us it's just been i've just got i'm just loving what we do as a profession and how we help people and and how you know there's many facets to improving people's lives and and your own as well so i'm a i've got a new love for what we do which has been which is the main thing but i think the main thing you said there too was just about the being on the constant path of learning whether it's whether it's the um the podiatry side of things you know, like rehab and working with patients or it's the business side it's just i th- I think no matter what you're doing, if you, like well, Ray Kroc say, you're either green or growing or you're ripe and rotting. This is it. And I think yeah. there's a lot of podiatrists that get their business to a certain point or they get their career to a certain point and they think, you know, I can just live off my past successes and don't need to do anything else. And yeah. the more you're standing still, the more everybody else is actually catching up. And, and they do, they get stale, they get boring, they become irrelevant. And once you stop that momentum of that constant growth, yeah, like mentally, I think it's hard to sort of to, to hit it start again. So I think the goal is just never stop, never stop so learning. True. It's so important. And and if you're not if you're not going forward, what are you going? You're just staying still, like you say. So it got, it came to that itch, and and uh, and it's been a revelation because I've got my brother as the manager, and we just bounce off each other. And I think I've been very lucky to set up an environment now where people are so welcomed, and what our our culture of our practice is being friendly, welcoming, everyone's involved in the team. And that has just excelled us in a small community. So it's, it's happened very quickly. And I think, uh, I think going forward, we've just got so much more to give and, and grow. And it's, it's so good to know that you're doing, you're doing good things um, for yourself, but also for people around you. So the, the podiatry profession, it's a great, it's a great thing. And um and the biggest takeout is, is to get people around you that can support you doing it as well. Yeah. Oh, look, I think you've had an amazing, uh, I want to apologize to everyone too. My voice is crap at the moment. I've been coughing. I've been muting the coughs. So I keep croaking in and out. Man flu. Um, yeah. Man flu I've got. So uh, as any male listening to this now knows it's one of the worst things to get, but I think you've had a really, really interesting career and story oh, you've had an interesting career so far an interesting story in the podiatry but before we wrap up have you got one final tip that you would like to share with anyone who's listening to this now whether there are a, yeah probably talking more to the you know because a lot of students listen to this podcast and recent graduates do you have a tip for them that um if they bumped into you and they said jay give me one really awesome tip to inspire me what do you got it's, it's, oh, it's a bit corny, but I think... Um, I'll be corny. Corny's fine. <laughs> it's, um, you're going to go through the hard times, but it's going to be hard during that time. And it's going to be much, much easier because, you, because you've gone through that time. And looking back on my story, I was in some interesting situations where I shouldn't have been. And I probably wasn't qualified to be there at the time. But looking back now, 
those experiences have gotten me where I was. So it's hard now, easy later for me. And you, you got to get it done, that hard stuff to be to be cruising now and really enjoying what you, what you did because you learned from that. So that would be my, my test. And the other thing is, you know, it's a team that helps you. So create your team early on. Really, really create your team. You know, still, still speak to people 10 years ago. So the team is always growing. And, um, and to have that team around you, it's going to be so important for yourself. And uh, you're going to love love those people forever and a day. So the biggest thing is, is culture is king, I think. And that mm, team environment is where, where we've got to be. Well, it's like when we did uh, week one of the 12-week reboot, and it was all about the cultural telescope. And yeah, and even if you're a solo practitioner, you still you still have a team around you. You've got your accountant, you've got your lawyers, you you've got your 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 partner in life. All these people are really part of your team. You've all got to be on the same path and the same trajectory if you want to sort of kick those goals and tick those boxes. You can't just do it all alone. You can't do it all alone and expose yourself to it, whatever you can at the time. A quick side story. Yeah. I'm doing it, helping a, a pod surgeon. We're doing a bunion and I'm standing there and we finish, we finished that particular surgery. And, and this older bloke grabs me and goes, You want to see what I do? And I said, Oh, yeah, I'm in a day surgery. And we're in the surgery and this person gets rolled in. I thought it was like a 15 year old boy. They're coming in and there's no shirt on it. He goes, we're putting these 400 cc's into this 17 year old girl. And I'm like, I looked at him and I go, oh, we're doing a boob job. And he goes, yeah, do you want to help me? And it was me, a nurse and an anesthetist. And I helped him separate a breastplate, get this implant into this person's chest. And it was the most interesting, horrific thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And, uh, and then within 10 minutes later, I was back doing a bunion surgery. So that you just don't know where you're going to end up. So um, that was a very interesting experience as well. And, I don't uh, know any other podiatrist <laughs> that's done that. Yeah. That's, uh, that is unique. It was, yeah, it was in the Gold Coast. And as we're doing it, he's going, it's just so, you know, it's society these days, this is what they need to have to be happy as he's doing the surgery and he's getting deep about me. It was one of the, an eye-opening experience. And um, when, when they woke up, I, I thought about that person. I thought, are they going to be in a lot of pain in them? No, yeah, so you didn't was, get to see the you didn't get to see the finished product. Uh, I, I was there early on, and we stitched up and things, and I was holding a couple of things. And um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Every really male good. podiatrist listening, every female podiatrist is going, "Don't ask that question." No, no, every male just, podiatrist is thinking. So, what was the end result? I remember a small tattoo on the uh, on the rib. So one day I might not see that tattoo and go, "Yeah, no, that, we did a good." Job okay, I was there. I was there that day. Yeah. Okay, Jay, I better finish yeah. up before someone complains. Um, yeah. I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast. Like I said, sharing your story. I think it's been very unique. And, and like I said, I, it was only a passing comment that you made about, oh, when I was in the AFL draft, that I thought, my oh, God, this needs to be shared with everyone because I thought it was great. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for the invite, mate. And I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch soon. See you soon. Yes. Very soon.